the book of Shmuel. We've uh, finished the 10th chapter. And we're holding at a place where Shaul, King Saul, Saul has been anointed as king, but at the same time, the community has not really accepted him fully. And at the end of chapter 10, it says that B'nai B'lial, uncultured people, um, base men, it says... Basically they, bums. What is that? Bums. Bums. Uh, base men, they said that, how could this person save us? And they ridiculed him. And they didn't give him a gift like the other people did. And so we're in an interesting uh, stage where, you know, the Jewish people have finally appointed a king, but this is not a popular person who they chose on their own. And this is an interesting point that, on the one hand, there's a very nice idea that a community, a, a, a nation, should have free choice who they choose as king. And uh, that's a democracy where the king is chosen. Thank you. By the, we, uh, by, can we? Yeah, I, I just muted everyone. The king Thank is chosen you. by Thank the people. You. But the way Hashem wanted to do this here is that even a democracy is not a perfect answer because it's nice that it gives the nation the ability to choose the majority of people. Uh, at least it gives them, you know, the choice is based on the majority of people. But at the same time, do, do they really know who the person is? Do they know the person inside out? Do they really, are they really making the right choice be based on what they should be choosing? Or are they, do they like him because he fits the party that they like? Or do they like his looks? Do they, do they like something else about him? And so democracy sounds good to us, but in truth, it's also a, a, a terrible way of choosing who a king should be. And so Hashem chose, and that's how we had in the last uh, chapter, we had that it was chosen, that Shaul was chosen based on a, some type of a, uh, uh, like a raffle. They did a, uh, the, in other words, a, a lot, they drew lots. And this was of course meant that God wanted him to be, they used a, an, a, a way of, uh, not, not in a sense that it was just whoever it fell on, that would be who the king is, but in a sense that Hashem is going to uh, choose who it's meant for. And then, even then, Shaul HaMelech did not want to accept it. He said, I don't, I don't know if, I'm not convinced. He says, I want to ask the Urim Vitumim. I want the, the, the breastplate of the high priest to prove that, uh, that this is meant. And sure enough, it did. It said Shoal. It said that this is meant. Now, at the same time that this is, you know, we are clearly have clear, uh, we have clarity that it's meant for Shoal to be king. There were those that still ridiculed him. I mean, you have to understand, he's from Benjamin. And even though we sort of uh, felt bad for Benjamin, Benjamin, um, made some bad choices in the previous book, the book of Shaftim, and uh, with the story of Pilegesh Begiva, there was a terrible story there, and uh, Benjamin made bad choices regarding not giving up to the Jewish people, to the rest of the Jewish people. They sort of um, helped protect the evil people that were part of their uh, tribe, and uh, which, which, which obviously was a mistake, and it created a whole civil war. And so in a certain sense, Benjamin, you know, was looked at as a, as a, um, as a tribe that wasn't of the highest 
stature. Additionally, Benjamin was the smallest tribe. They were almost wiped out. They were almost wiped out to the extent that we were afraid that there would be no one left from Benjamin. And so, uh, and then Shaul, who was Shaul? People didn't know who he was. Rabbi? Yes. I, ne I never thought of a kingship as a democracy. I never, I never kept those two together. Uh-huh. Well, democracy you get after you get rid of the king. Right. Well, the, the point is that because uh, we think of kings as someone who kills everyone who blocks them and they cho they choose to be king. Um, right. That's the way a king right. works. You just destroy whoever kills more people and chooses yeah. to be king and and he becomes king. But. Uh, that's not what happened here at all. So because the Jewish people wanted a king, how should in this scenario, this is not the typical scenario of some, you know, Arab country where they, the king is uh, choosing, he wants, he, someone wants to be king. We're, we're dealing with the Jewish, you know, to, to make a separation. Uh, uh, the, the, we have a nation that wants a king, and how should they go about choosing who, they, who, who should be their king? And here Hashem says, I am going to choose. And uh, uh, Shmuel Hanavi says, it's, you know, it's going to be based on Hashem. It's not, you know, we're not going to be the ones who are going to decide who we want as the king. Yes, uh, Robert. Okay. No, I understand what Ben is saying. I think the way I look at it is that when Hashem create, did the process to appoint the king, he did it through some what I would call artifice. He created the sort of the imagery that it was going to be this lottery, but I think he knew where he wanted the leadership to go to. But also, again, we as the Hebrews wanted to be like other nations and wanted to have a king, but it's clear that we wanted a benign king because there is a difference between the ultimate monarch who goes off with their head versus the king who is benign because he's in favor of his people growing and living in peace. And maybe that's the basis because we wanted to be a nation like all other nations and should, we should have a king like all the others. So I'm not sure if what you're saying, Robert, is, is exactly the, the scenario here and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to translate the word benign that you're using. Um, he's we not are... evil, he's not evil. He's not corrupt. Right. He's not evil or corrupt. Okay, that's a good. Okay, then that's fine. But at the same time, he does have extra power. Then, um, and has the ability to destroy any person who rebels, whether you know whether they deserve the death penalty or not. He has the right to give them that death penalty, and uh, the Torah gives him that right because they are rebelling against him. Uh, in any, you know, in any shape or form of rebellion. Okay. So he, he does have extreme rights, much more than are necessarily what you would call logical. Or it's, democratic, or democratic rights. Democratic, we, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I guess that would be a good word. Right, yeah, yeah. more than democratic rights. He has extreme rights. And, uh, but that's what the people want. The people want the king. They want to be like the other nations. Hashem is not happy about this. Again, Hashem wanted that the way, the, the, the way things were with the judges, the way things were with the shoftim, that we, we don't really need a king. Hashem is our king. <laughs> And but you want a king, we're going to do it. And Shaul is going to uh, re Muel Hanavi is going to rebuke the people for this that they sin, they shouldn't. And we'll see that in chapter 12 that he's going to rebuke them that they should not have requested. And as we see, this is uh, you know, this is not the king that has this is not the way Hashem wanted things to be. Uh, the king is supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. Here we're getting a king from. A different tribe. Not only that, what is the name of the king? The name is Shaul. He's borrowed. Shaul means to borrow. He's not meant for kingdom, for the kingdom to be long term. He's like temporary. Now, if he if he succeeds, if he makes the right choices, he is given the 
um, he will be given the go ahead that he will be able to continue. It'll stay with him to some extent. It'll always be Shaul. Shaul. Oh, God. I don't know what that was. Uh, it'll all, it, you know, his name is Shaul. It's not. It's, it's something on Moshe. Got okay, Moshe, you have to stay muted. Sorry. Until you get yourself a new computer, Moshe, you got to stay muted. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the fact that Shaul is king is the choice is Hashem's choice. Hashem chose him to be the king, but not as a preferable uh, idea of uh, of Hashem. It's a preferable. It, it was it's it was initiated by the people's request, and Hashem went forward and allowed it. Yes, Robert. But again, by using by the definition of his name, Shaul, means that he's borrowed. He's sort of a tra- he is the transitional king. Because just by his identity, it could be good, it could be bad, but the proof, as they say, is in the pudding. But at least we want to have a king like everybody else. And it's a, some of it is you know, very much a logical you know, evolution of a people figuring out, well, kings don't work, so let's try something else or some, equal, some equilibrium within the process. Just by his definition of being borrowed means that you know, it, it's loaded with a lot of... A, a, a lot of strength, I guess, is the word that I can use. I think the main point in that he's borrowed is that he's he's here as a um, as someone to fill the need of the time until the time for King David comes. Now he Good will be allowed to continue in a in a in a in, a, in, a, in some type of. Um, a position in some type of a position, even after King David, but it's not going to be, you know, the real thing. It, it'll be over a few tribes. He'll be second to the king. He could, if he, if he merits, he could continue. But again, he is really not the one who it's meant for. He's, he's here as a, he's borrowed. He's here temporary and that is the that is what's going on now. Shaul uh, was Shmuel Hanavi chose him. He chose him twice already. Number one, he took him a, and poured oil over him, not in front of people. Then he did this whole ceremony in front of the people with the with uh, with making a lot. Pull uh, um, um, he uh, made this type of a. A, uh, a a lottery of pulling his name out, showing that he's going to be the one who's meant that God wants him. God is choosing him, and he's single, he's singling him out. And then he does the it go the urim betumim, which is the breastplate of the kohen gadol. And so ultimately, uh, he he's had his appro- uh, approval in front of the people by God. God has shown his approval. Now. Uh, the people are, there are still skeptics among the people. And so chapter 11 is going to be where Shaul is now going to prove himself. Now, at this time, where is Shaul? What is Shaul doing? So the commentary is debate. Did he continue just shepherding his sheep, his father's uh, uh, flock or uh, his flock? Um, and we'll see in one of the verses here in, Ch- in verse 5, where he, it's, it's, it's unclear if he's, if he sort of goes back to norm, like he sees not everyone is accepting him as king. So he's sort of waiting for the moment that he is going to be accepted. So it's the full acceptance of king. He's not, he's, he's, he's not feeling the element of kingship uh, to, the, to its fullest extent. Now, the, the commentaries look at Shaul as, he made a mistake here. People ridiculed him. The base men, they said, how could he save us? Was Shaul wrong for not punishing them? Or was he right for acting humble? The commentaries look at him. The way it's understood is that he made a mistake. He should have punished those that questioned him. 
Shaul, in a certain sense, was too humble. He should have punished those who he is king. And a king, the, the Talmud says, a king that forgives, is um, his forgiveness is not accepted. A king is not allowed to forgive because when, when a king forgives, it is, um, it is an embarrassment to his kingdom. And therefore, he didn't act appropriately by not punishing the skeptics. Yes, Moshe. Okay, uh, this is what I wanted to ask. Um, do you think that um, Shmuel wanted him to be king in the first place? Or do you think there was a, maybe a ein? He was, maybe he was under the influence of an ein hurrah because he um, basically he was a very good looking guy from uh, Shaul, you know. And um, the fact that they didn't want a king in the first place, the whole purpose was to prove that a king was not needed and that the people demanded it. And he chose him for the purpose of failing. And he knew that he was going to, uh, you know, not go after the Amalekites, you know. Um, and he knew that he was going to uh, kill up the Haggadol, the, the Kohanim Haggadol, you know. He was going to go through this whole process. And, and, and it was going to be so devastating that the people would then decide that it's not necessary, that it's, it, it, this should prove that you don't need a king. You don't need a malach. You don't need a malach. You know? Well, this is it's what not I exactly was... so, Moshe, because ultimately the Jewish people, God wanted the Jewish people to have a king, but at a later stage. And the conquering of Israel, God did not want them to have a king. The conquering of Israel, God wanted it to be done through the Shoftim in, in a miraculous way. But did Shmuel, did Shmuel want, it, want that? Because he had two sons, want, you know, that were... Shmuel had no interest at all in doing anything that Hashem didn't want. And Hashem did not want a king at this time. But after the people asked for it, Hashem said, well, you got to do it. So Shmuel went forward and did what Hashem wanted. In, and he anointed Shaul, who Hashem had chosen. So it's not about Shmuel's interests, because Shmuel had no interest of his own. It's all Shmuel's interest was completely Hashem's interest. And uh, Shmuel was just following whatever Hashem told him to do. Now, Shmuel was quite shocked about this request for a king, because he knew that that's not what Hashem initially wanted. He was hurt that this is how the people are, are choosing to request a king. He knew that this was against Hashem's wishes, but Hashem then told him, I, you know, you got to go forward. And Hashem told Shmuel, they're not, they're not telling you they don't like you. They're telling me they don't like me. That's what Hashem told Shmuel. Told, right, that you shouldn't be the one insulted. I'm the one who should be insulted. So it, 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 was, it was against Hashem. Does that answer your question, Moshe? <laughs> Yes, yes, it does. Okay, great. So let's continue. We're in uh, chapter 11, verse 1. Then Nachash the Ammonite went up and besieged this Yavesh Gilad. And all the people of Yavesh said to Nachash, seal a covenant with us and we will serve you. So uh, th there's a, it's very interesting that we're learning this this week because this Parsha, this week's Torah portion talks about the country of Ammon. And it tells us that we're not allowed to marry a Moabite and an Ammonite in this week's Parsha. And the reason why we're not allowed to marry them is because they did not, they were not uh, kind to us. They were evil and cruel to us when we left Egypt. And uh, it says even if they convert, we're not allowed to marry. We're not allowed to marry them. The Talmud says it only applies to the men. The conclusion of the Talmud, but there was a big discussion that it might even apply to the women. Uh, but the conclusion is that it only applied to the men, and therefore Ruth, Rus, who came from Moab, she was actually. The conclusion is that she was allowed to marry Boaz, who ended up being the um, mother, the grandmother, great grandmother of King David, but. Um, but, uh, but there was a, there, there was question about that. But if, if Rus was a male, she would, they would, she would not, uh, you know, it, 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 he would not have been able to marry into the Jewish community because, uh, 
there because she was from Moab and Moab and Ammon in the verse in this week's Torah portion are put together. Both Moab and Ammon are not allowed to marry into the Jewish people. So as I said, it applies to the men. Now, Nachash is the king of Ammon and he's very angry about this law. He knows the Torah doesn't allow them to marry into the Jewish people. That's a big insult. You people are evil. Nachash knows that he's considered evil and cruel. And he is, uh, now the name Nachash, Nachash literally means a snake. But he's the, that's his name. His name is Snake. And he's, from, he's an Ammonite. And he, he's besieged, he made a siege around this place called Yavesh Gilad. Now Gilad is part of the tribe of Menashe that's on the other side of the Jordan River, the east side. This is beyond the general Israel. This is beyond, this is east of the regular um, uh, uh, continental uh, 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 of Israel, the continent of Israel. This is uh, the extra land that we conquered east of it, east of the Jordan. And um, Nachash, the Ammonite, is, made a siege around them and told the people there, Yavesh Gilad, that, um, you know, he wanted them, he wanted to conquer them. And um, they said to him, let's make a deal. We'll serve you. You want us to serve you? We'll serve you. They sort of, now, the, 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 uh, the understanding is that he was taking advantage of these people, the Yavesh, Yavesh Gilad people. Um, number one, uh, he felt this was a, a small city. Um, they are not going to be defended by the rest of the nation because they are east of the regular, east of the of the of Israel. They are out. They are over beyond the Jordan, and um, he felt that the Jewish people are still not. They don't really have the king yet. Shoal has not been fully established, and there was a story. Um, of the, the people of Yavesh Gilad refused to fight with the rest of the Jewish people when they were doing their war. Uh, one of the wars, the war against the, uh, the Benjaminites. And so Yavesh Gilad, um, Nachash, the king of Ammon, felt they're probably, no one's going to come to their rescue because the rest of the Jewish people have a grudge against the Yavesh Gilad people. And... Um, uh, additionally, they sort of, it's possible that they felt that um, because Shaul is related to the Yavesh Gilad people, because Yavesh Gilad, a lot of the men from Yavesh Gilad, um, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the women from Yavesh Gilad married the men from, from Benjamin, which means that, that, that Shaul would be a relative of, of their, of these people. And, um, um, uh, they uh, Nachash felt that if he if he destroys them, that would be a big humiliation to the new king. So there's a lot of understand. You know, you have to understand what's going on in the. This is the context of the story, and so so Nachash is now besieging the people, and the people of Yavesh Gilad they sort of want to make a fast deal. They want. They say, listen, uh, let's make a deal with you. But Nachash uh, decided that he has, he's, he's going to hit them up with a real tough uh, option. So Nachash, where in verse 2, Nachash the Ammonite replied to them, on this condition I will see a covenant with you. When each right eye of yours is put out, it will be a sign of shame for all of Israel. Um so, in other words, if you want to make a deal, you want to be my people, I will accept that. But you will all have to be blinded in one eye. That's his deal with them. You want to be my people? You want to start paying me tax? You want to start? You want to be part of my nation? No problem. But you're gonna. But each of your right eyes are gonna have to be blinded. Now, as I mentioned. One of the explanations of your right eye will have to be blinded. The right eye refers to the Torah. You're going to have to remove from the Torah the prohibition of marrying an Ammonite. You're going to have to allow 
the Ammonites to marry into your, your nation. At least that's one of the uh, explanations in the Medrash, Medrash Shmuel. There's, there's other, Rashi brings the, all the commentaries really bring this Medrash Shmuel, this Midrash that, that, that mentions this idea. Uh, the Medrash mentions a few ideas. It mentions that the, the eye either means the, uh, the, uh, you'll have to surrender your skilled archers and slingers. And the other uh, explanation is you'll have to abolish the Sanhedrin, the court which is the eye of the people, what they're called the, the, the eye of the people. And the, the final, uh, uh, the, the, the third explanation uh, of the Medrash is that it refers to the Torah, that they're going to have to abolish this law and um, that it says in the Torah um, that, not to, that all Ammonite people can't marry the Jewish nation. Yes, Susan. All right, I, I just want to be uh, sure about this. You're not telling me history, you're telling me a story. There's no such thing. I am not telling you any stories. I am only telling you the truth, the history. This but is it's something that you will uh, benefit from knowing because there's no such thing as just history. Everything is a lesson for us. So no, no, no stories, no. I am no. not giving stories. <laughs> No, what I'm asking you, this is a story to demonstrate uh, how we got where we are, how the Jewish people. Uh, this is our history of the the and beginnings of the kings, and the, the, we're learning the book of Shmuel, part of our which is the book of the prophets. It's going to tell us the prophecies and the uh, origin okay. of 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 the of the kings, which also during that time, there were a lot of prophets that lived then. We're gonna hear okay. about the, the, the prophecies of the prophets. We're gonna hear about how King David came to power and so all of these things truth. are gonna give us Telling lessons. The true we'll, story. This is the true story, nothing okay. but the truth. Okay, all right, thank okay. you. I, I just, I, I was very, I didn't understand exactly. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is the prophets, one of the books, one of the 24 books. Rabbi? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I want to say to me that period of time is, is when it sounds like people were used to cut out the eye of, of the enemy. They did the same to Samson. The Plishtim did the same to Samson. It's the same period of time, basically. And, and so apparently it, it was something known. Maybe Bilam lost his eye one of those ways too. I don't know. Because they keep mentioning the same thing. You know, he didn't have his eye. He didn't have his eye. Huh. So, uh, it, you know, they obviously use different ways of uh, punishing. You know, punishing, punishing their enemies. Right. Um, I don't know if the eye uh, blinding them was a very common way of uh, punishing their enemy, or it was once in a while. But, shaming uh, them. Shaming them, right? But yeah. here we have explanations of the eye. The explanation of their, of you know, the use of this term is is uh, is based on the, the three options of what the eye refers to. The eye in the Talmud refers to the Sanhedrin. The eye of the Jewish people is the Torah. And the eye, the eye could also mean a slinger or, you know, someone is a perfect slingshot or archer. So, it, it, you know, it uses but, that but term. The, the, the tribe of, of uh, Menashe closed their eyes to the Torah to begin with when, when they helped Benjamin, the, the tribe of Benjamin. Because the Torah wouldn't let you marry into a tribe that is killing other 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 Jews. No, 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 no. At the after the story of the Benjamin uh, destruction of uh, Pelega, the war, the civil war, right. the Jewish people, the entire Jewish people, was very nervous that there would be no future for Benjamin, and so they they on the fifteenth day of Av. The Sanhedrin came up with a um, with a, uh, a permit that allowed that the uh, no one is allowed to marry uh, to 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 give their daughters 
into Benjamin, but the Benjaminites are allowed to take our daughters for marriage. And so the 15th day of Av became a day of unity. This was after the war was over in the well, rabbi. How can they take them if you, don't give the, if you don't want to give the, the daughters to them? How can they just come and take them? The point is that we're, we're not dealing with youngsters. And we're dealing with the, we, the Sanhedrin gave a permit that the people of that we were only prohibited in making a shidduch. But if the people of Benjamin came and, 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 and took them out and chose them for marriage, you know, that was allowed. It wasn't against the rule that the Jewish people made up that we're not marrying into Benjamin. In other words, that they explained that the limitation of the Jewish people that they that we made such a uh, a strict promise that we're not going to give our daughters to marriage. So the Benjaminites meant that we're not going to do it um, with our. It's not going to be done with our permission. But if if our daughter, you know, if they if they come and choose to marry from our our kids, it, we're not we're not obligated to stop it. And that's how the Sanhedrin understood the promise. Yes, uh, Isaac. In medieval times, they used to call this an act of fealty, F-E-A-L-T-Y, where you demonstrated your loyalty by doing something to yourself. They used to have night, you had to chop off a pinky or something to show that they were dead. Even the Japanese, I think, in World War II, they also went through this process of showing fealty to the king and to the kingdom that their commitment is there. So could be an eye. So you're talking, uh, you're going, you're, you're talking about the earlier point uh, that they, uh, of people uh, of, uh, of commitment. Uh -huh. Of a king it, it, demanding something of a subject to uh -huh. show his fealty, to show his loyalty, to show uh -huh. his commitment. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Very interesting. We do find Stop that. The, just one second. We do find such a thing with chopping off their thumbs uh, that they uh, to show their commitment to Bar Koziva, Bar Kochva. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you do find such a thing. But, um, just one and second. Think, did, condemned it terribly. Right, of course, it's terrible. Made it everyone a, a balmum. How did you? Do, how could you do such a thing? But uh, that was. Uh, but that was his uh, Bar Kochva's uh, way of feeling everyone's loyal. Right. So the word is fealty. Now we learned a new word. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sadly, yeah, sadly. Just one second. David had a question before you, Phyllis. David, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to say that Mayam Lois uh, tells said that why did they uh, tell over this thing with the, taking out the eye, besides all the reasons that you said, is that the Torah wanted to show their uncivilized behavior because the people from Amon, uh, from Amon were a notoriously brutal people. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. That's a very important, very good point. Very great point. Well, yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, Phyllis, your turn. Yes. Um, it, what I uh, wanted to mention is that so often we are accused, quote unquote, of, of being uh, purveyors of Talon law because of the concept an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, I don't know where exactly that uh, expression comes from, but it's attributed to us and uh, as being tzedek, as being, you know, making a, an equivalency. And so it indicates that maybe an eye was used uh, as a as a a mark of uh, uh, diminution of of status in, in those days and and like Ben Sion said uh, he mentioned what happened to the Shimshon under the Plishtim so I think that also gives credence to it but I also wanted to just, just add one second Phyllis Phyllis before you before you jump to another point so what you what you're saying is that uh, Possibly uh, another idea of why they would, why the Ammonite king would choose such a horrific uh, type of uh, agreement 
uh, for the Jew against the Jewish people was because he was angry that the Jewish people believe in an eye for an eye. Is that what you're saying? Um, possibly. I mean, uh-huh. if that's if 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 our uh, if our position did, did come before right. that, then yes. Uh huh. So th- th- it does say ayin tachas ayin in the Torah, an eye for an eye. The only thing is that that's not the way it's interpreted. It's the way the Talmud understands it and the way in Jewish history we've always followed it is a monetary value. Someone damages Ooh. someone. It's always the, 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 we, we, we have puni- the punishment is not an eye for an eye. It's the, the, the value of an eye is, is done for an eye. And that's the, the it's always mumbling. It's always monetary. So I'm not sure if there is any, uh, why a nation would believe that if it's totally not done in the Jewish community, if anything, that would be done in the, you know, in the other nations, uh, probably, uh, you know, they probably followed such ideas, but the Jewish people never, never followed that. It wasn't like it was a debate or anything. We never had such a translation of the Torah, even though it says those words, but that was never the interpretation of the Jewish people. It, you know, uh, it, it all. It really it's like David says, they're cruel. Uh-huh. They were cruel, the Ammonites. What I wanted also to know is if the Ammonites and the Moabites um, are considered classified, even though I thought they were Ishmaelites, are they classified with Amalek, a descendant of Esau? Because no. if the Am- Amalekites were cruel to us leaving Egypt also. Right. No, it's a different breed. They're also cruel, but they're different. Rabbi, can different, I... Inter- different blood. Yes. Uh, I thought, or I was taught that it's not more than an eye for an eye. Not more is uh-huh. understood. Right. But Ju- Judaism doesn't believe in an eye for an eye. In that sense, of in, in the sense in the in the sense that you know uh, Phyllis is using it that uh, you punish an eye for an eye, they're, they're, the punishment is always a, it's it's a monetary value of oh. uh, 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 you know to be exact. Yes, uh, Robert. Uh, my question is <clears throat> clearly there's a misunderstanding of that phrase, um, and maybe part of it is is that those of us contemporary Jews and in the past have not had the foundation of understanding what an eye for an eye uh, meant relative to who we are as a people. But again, I believe in Christianity, they take it literally when they go to war or they want to impart um, some damage on somebody else. And they attribute it to a quote unquote, the Old Testament, which uh-huh. they in their stupidity see it as a literal you know, edict. Uh-huh. The uh-huh. same yes. as Saudi Arabia. Uh-huh. And yeah, look uh-huh. what the look what the Arabs do on, on again the um, Sharia law. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But also, right. Rebbe, yes, not not one of these people who misinterpreted it read Hebrew or understood uh-huh. it. When you say ayin tachas ayin, it's the same way as is meant when Abraham found the isle. And he right, took it right. tachas bino, instead of instead of it's not it's not one for one it's instead of place of uh huh so the idea right. is just to show equivalence like on the scale and I you did this much damage you will pay this much in money but you know the thing so, is that these so what people you're saying, are, are spreading propaganda against us. Well, so I don't know if, if Phyllis, that's an interesting thought of yours. Very interesting. I don't know if, you know, the commentaries don't seem to mention that. And I don't know if that's the way they look at the Jewish people, uh, you know, believing it. Again, it's an interesting thought. And I, 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 I'm glad that you're really thinking deeply. Um, uh, you know, it's an interesting thought. But again, I don't know if that's uh, if you can if you can say that that's the you know one of the meanings here. It's definitely definitely uh, 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 food for for us to look into. It's uh, something to do a little more research. But the simple meaning, as I mentioned, is is not that way. Okay, so Rap, one more one more question, please. When yeah. you said that they're talking about the Torah, 
that's the eye that they meant that right. they want us to follow the Torah. They want us to, to burn. They want us to, to oh. blind it and okay. remove that verse from the Torah. Burn it, maybe. Get rid of it. That's what they would like. And then they'll feel good, like they're good people, as if as if we can remove the fact, the 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 the, the facts of who they are by removing it from the books, as if you can change history by taking it out. It's not going to change anything. That we know the truth. Right. But that's right. what they think that if we remove it, they will uh, feel more comforted. But that's not happening because we know the facts. And so, in any event, so I'm let's so sorry, Rabbi D'Andrea. Yeah, you, you had said that there have been interpretations of um, what the eye for an eye that the midrash said uh, it could. It, well, we were just discussing how you, they wanted us to take the portion where you're not allowed to intermarry with them. No, you no, said no. also that it was about. Just one second, Andrea. There's two separate things. Our discussion, let me mute everyone, not working, okay, our discussion here has nothing to do with an eye for an eye, Phyllis brought that in, which was very interesting, and thank you Phyllis for bringing that in, but that's nothing to do with our discussion here, our discussion here really has to do with the fact that Nachash, the king of Amon, wanted us wanted the people of Yavesh Gilad, a Jewish, a, a group of the Jewish people that lived in Yavesh Gilad, that they'll make peace with Nachash and let him be king on the condition that he, that they, that they allow him to blind every single person's right eye in their nation. Otherwise, they're going to slaughter them to death. So either they, they will slaughter them to death, or if you want peace, Nachash, the king of Amin, said, I will, if, if you want peace, I will accept it, but you will need to be blind in one eye, every single Jew who lives in Yavesh Gila. That was the two options that they were facing. And, um, and, and, and the commentary to the fact that he wanted them to be blind in, in one eye was the deeper meaning of that was that he wanted to blind the, he wanted to burn out the law in the Torah, which is also considered their eye, that, that the Ammonite, um, uh, the Ammonites are not allowed to marry the Jewish people. So what that means is that on the one hand, he was talking in a literal sense, but on a deeper level, he was also talking about the anger he had to the Torah. So he's talking on both levels. On the one hand, he's talking practically. He wants to blind the Jewish people. And on a deeper level, he wants to, he wants to get that permit. Uh, he wants the Jews to remove that law from the Torah, as if we have the right to, to decide what's in the Torah, as if it helps if we remove something from the Torah scroll. It, nothing is changing, but he's thinking that, you know, he's angry about that law and he would like that to be removed. So now, yes, now on, uh, on that, Andrea, feel free to, to speak. Thank you. So you had said, too, that the Midrash, there's commentaries about what that passage means. As you just said, there's two, the two levels, the literal and the one where he wants to wipe out the fat in the, in the Torah that the intermarriage is not allowed. You said, too, <laughs> that um, a right eye, if you will, could be linked to the, the court, our courts that made our decision. He didn't want that anymore either or at least it was an interpretation and then there was a third and i don't know what the third was the third was that he wants us to get rid of all of our archers in our um, linger though those that were professional archers he wanted us to uh, give give those up because this way he would feel safe as king you know if we got rid of any of the professional um uh, sharpshooters you know that's what he wanted us to uh, to give in and that they're also called that we should surrender them so once he gets rid of the eyes you know though the the sharpshooters i think that's what it's called uh you know then we would um 
you know, then he would then he would be happy to accept us as accept the, the, the people of Yavish Gilad as his people, as part of his nation. Okay, so let's go further. Um, the elders, uh, where in verse three, the elders of Yavish replied to him, hold off from attacking us for seven days while we send messengers throughout all the land of Israel. If uh, there is no one to save us, then we will go out to you and submit and we'll go forward with, you can blind us. So they're on the one hand, they're saying, let's see, let's see if it's true. If you really, in other words, Nachash, the king of Amain, is claiming that no one's gonna, gonna help you. And he's making a mockery out of them and saying, you know, you're gonna, you, you know, this is, this is the story. Um, it will be a sign of shame for all of Israel. And, uh, you know, Nachash is relying on the fact that no one will help them. They, they made mistakes in the past. And the Jewish people are not going to stand up for them. The Jewish people have a weak king in the first place. Uh, he's just starting starting out. They're, they're taking advantage of a vulnerable group. The Nachash is taking advantage of a vulner, vulnerable group. And uh, the, El, the, uh, the people of Yavesh is trying to buy time. Uh, I, well, I mean, they're, they're really trying to buy time and get the people together. But they're also implying to uh, Nachash that, you know, you might be successful and you'll see, you might be right that no one's going to, you know, no one's going to help us. We're not going to be able to, 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 to get this group, to, to anyone together to fight you. Yes, uh, David. I, the, the verse itself, when it says they're going to gouge out the right eyes and then it'll be a sign of shame. Oh, that's, that sounds like that's the primary sign of shame that all the Jews have to have no eye, the right eye. The secondary shame is the fact that nobody's coming to their rescue. Is that right? Um, I, I that's the way I understand it. Yeah. Uh, do you see any other commentary? That's the way I understood it. That the main shame is that they're not getting rescued, or that the, the main shame is they're all uh, only 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 with well, one eye. That that they're they're only having one eye, and. Um, I'm just looking now at the commentaries just to make sure that no one, that there isn't another explanation here. That, that, that's, that was my understanding, that they don't, you know, not having an eye will be a, a sign of shame. Let me just see. Um, I got that. I, I didn't catch what you said before. Just uh, one second. Um, I mean, the Matsudas David says that this will be a great shame that no one will save you from this embarrassment, that no one will be able to save. It sort of merges these two ideas together. It'll be a big embarrassment that no one's going to be able to save you from this big shame. So it sounds like it's a sort of like a combination of the two things. Okay. So, uh, so now we have the... Uh, the elders of Yavesh replied, uh, you know, give us seven days. And uh, when all in the verse four says, when all the messengers arrived at Givat Shaul, reported these words to the people, all the people raised their voices and wept. And, um, and uh, uh, so the people of, of Givat Shaul, uh, which is a whole other area when they heard about this, these, these are the, 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 the people of Givat Shaul are not, going to suffer from this this but they're ju they're ju it's just that their brothers their brethren are so are going to suffer and they 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 felt they 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 wept just then Shaul came in from the field so and be uh behind his oxen and Shaul said why are the people crying they told him the words of the men of Yavish so these are not the people of Yavish Gilad but the people of Yavish Gilad had told the people of uh, Givat Shaul about this about this uh, decree that's uh, hovering over them, and uh, people of Yavish Gilad uh, of uh, Givat Shaul felt terrible, and uh, Shaul, who had come in from the field, so again here we're we're dealing with Shaul, the the new king who seems to be still with his sheep, like he's he's 
he's uh, with his oxen, excuse me, with his oxen, he is, uh, he's still doing his regular job. Like he hasn't really taken over the kingship uh, as a full reign. He's, he's, uh, he's behind his oxen. At least that's one explanation. Another explanation is, no, it just happens to be that time of the year that they bring their oxen in from the field. And so it's not that he was full-time uh, working, doing the same type of work that he had uh, until now, but that, um, but that uh, he, he really discontinued his field work and, but now he arrived at the scene when it was the, you know, the, the time to bring in the oxen. So there's two uh, explanations of, uh, of the story. But um, basically, the, the, the point is that Shaul is not fully acting as king. And all of a sudden now, he's going to mobilize a, uh, an, uh, uh, a, a, an army to fight the enemy. And so that's, that's where we're holding now. So Shoal had asked them why they're crying. They told him. So verse six says, the spirit of Hashem passed over Shoal when he heard these things and he became very angry. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, which he sent with messengers throughout the land of Israel saying, whoever does not go out after Shoal and Shmuel to battle, so shall be done to his oxen. And so um, what, what, what uh, Shoal did was he took a pair of his own oxen cut them up into pieces and scared the Jewish people, not in a, in, in a sense of shocking them, but in a sense of um, inspiring them to, to realize that they, they better join. And, um, um, uh, and he uses the word Shmuel. He uses the prophet Shmuel's name to encourage them to, to, to come because they're going to need to follow not only its shoal, but Shmuel gave him the right. So Shmuel, uh, so they have to follow in, in Shmuel's name, they, you know, they have to follow, uh, uh, they, they have to follow him because he's a, he's delegated by Shmuel. And um, a dread of Hashem fell upon the people and they went forth as one man. So, uh, so he, he basically is able to get a huge amount of people. Uh, and let's see in the next verse, uh, he counted them at Bezek. Now, Bezek either is a place or uh, Bezek could mean broken uh, shards, which means, uh, um, um, or stones it could mean, which means that he wanted to count them, but he's not allowed to count the Jewish people we don't count and instead we use some item that they give you that you count the item instead of like, for example, in the Torah, they used a half a shekel, a half a coin. They gave a half a dollar, so to speak, and they counted the half dollars. And that's how in the Torah, Jewish people were counted. Here, the Jewish people are being counted by Bezek. So it's either a place or it means a shard or it means stones. And he counted them and there were how many people? And the children of Israel, 300,000. Men of Judah were 30,000. And what we see here is that he separated the people of Judah to be counted on their own. Why are the people of Judah being counted on their own? So what, it, what, what the, the understanding is that the people of Judah, um, Shaul realized they're going to be a little upset that he's king. They're going to be the ones who are not so impressed because Judah is the right, is really the right, a tribe to have a king and here Shaul is now becoming a, he's now so to speak became a king and he's going to be doing an act of uh, uh, of his kingship by mobilizing an army and he wants the people of Judah to have some type of respect extra respect because he's showing them a certain respect um, acknowledging them as a special tribe in this way, hopefully they won't uh, want to rebel and they'll acknowledge him as king, not in a, in a sense that he doesn't, uh, he's, he's looking to get fans, but in a sense that he's trying to do what's best for the Jewish people and to allow them not to feel any animosity towards the fact that he was the one who was chosen. 
So he's giving them, they also the, the largest maybe of the, of the tribes and so on. So he's giving them some respect and he counts 300,000 of the regular, the, the entire Jewish people plus 30,000 of the people of Judah. And they said, verse nine, they said to the messengers who had come, so shall you tell the people of Yavish Gilad, tomorrow there will be a salvation for you by the time the sun gets hot. And here we have, and the messengers came and told the people of Yavesh, and they rejoiced. So it's interesting, just this morning, we learned about Bacham Hashemesh, the sun uh, got hot. And here we have uh, a verse in the Tanakh, Kechoim Hashemesh, when the sun gets hot. Now, if anyone wants extra credit, if you tell me what hour of the day does the sun get hot? And uh, if you remember from this morning, the class this morning, what is that? 12 noon. It's either 12 noon or the fourth hour. Now there's the Chaim Hayoim and there's the Chaim Hashemesh. There's when the day gets hot and when the sun gets hot. One of them is 12 noon. One of them is, uh, is, te is, is 10, is uh, 10 a.m. And Kachayim uh, Hashemesh, when the sun gets hot, actually is um, in the Gemara. It translates it as when uh, the, when the uh, it means when the um, in the town in the Gemara. It, 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 it this morning it seems that it means the fourth hour of the day. The interesting thing is here the Matudas Tzion says it means twelve noon, as Susan just said. So. Uh, it, it deserves to be looked into how can they translate to Chaim Hashemesh differently than the Talmud that we learned this morning for those that are part of the morning the class uh, how, how, how it would you know how you can translate it here uh, differently so something to, to look into we're not going to get into that now but um, uh, in any event the, um, the the Jewish people told the people of, you know, they sent a message to the Yavish Gilad people that, you know, don't worry. So then the people of Yavish Gilad, so we're in verse 10. So the people of Yavish said to Nachosh, tomorrow we will go forth to you and may you do, and you may do to us whatever seems good in your eyes. And what they're saying is that they're implying like it doesn't look like we're getting anywhere, but uh, it doesn't look like anyone's going to help us. Um, um, and they left it, you know, ambiguous, but uh, in a sense that the, the Ammonites are going to now think that they're basically going to surrender and, um, and uh, you know, just give us till tomorrow. And tomorrow we'll, uh, we'll you know, they're implying like they're going to surrender. And, um, of course, the people of Yavesh intended that tomorrow we're going to surprise you and fight, but they didn't say that. And verse uh, um, 11, it was on the next day that Shaul set the people into three companies and three groups. And, uh, and they entered the camp of the Ammonites at the approach of dawn, and they struck down the Ammon by the time the day became hot. And here it's Choim uh, Hayoim. So... Um, uh, here it does say the heat of the day. Um, and um, there were survivors, but they scattered. There did not remain of them two men together. That means they, they, they scattered so, 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 there were so few people left and they were so... Um, they had to scatter so so much that there were not even two people that were running together. And um, the people then said to Shmuel, who is it that said, will Shaul reign over us? Um, meaning, give the men over and we will put them to death. Let's go and anyone that wasn't happy with Shaul becoming king, let's go and punish them. But Shoal said to them, let no man be put to death today, this day, for today Hashem has wrought salvation in Israel. So Shoal did not like the idea to punish those who were rebelled initially against him. In verse 14, then Shmuel said to the people, so Shmuel now said, come and let us go to Gilgal and let us renew the kingdom there. 
we're going to now accept Shaul for a third time. So this is going to be the third uh, an acceptance of Shaul. First, it was just Shmuel and Shaul alone. Then it was Shaul with the Jewish people. And now it's going to be everyone accepting him. Now he won a war for the Jewish people and he saved the people of Yavesh Gilad from destruction. And so now we're going to accept him there as a, uh, you know, as full-fledged king over us. So all the people went to Gilgal. There they made Shaul king before Hashem in Gilgal. And there they slaughtered feast, peace offerings before Hashem. And their Shaul, as well as all the men of Israel, rejoiced exceedingly. And that concludes chapter 11. So the idea is that now everyone is going to accept him. And it's based on the fact that he proved himself with the fact that he won this war against this evil king, Nachash, the king of um, Ammon. Rabbi? Yes. How much physical time did this actually take? How many days or weeks or months? It was the same day. They won on that day. They won the war in one day. They, in other words, they in one day they got that many people together to work as a unit, and the next day they won. Well, they had seven days to mobilize the army. Oh, okay. And that one day they fought. And in one, just that one day, it was that's amazing. amazing. Everybody has to do the same thing. You have to try and kill the enemy. It's not like today's armies with, with uh, planes and ships and things, you know, they were walked up there and started hitting. That's it. <laughs> right. And Hashem is on your side, so that speeds up the process. Right. That's right. That's right. It's all miraculous. It's not a, uh, it's not a, pra it's, you know, you can't think of it in a practical sense. You have to th realize this is all miraculous. This is... Uh, it's all from Hashem. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful uh, evening, and I'll see you on Yat Hashem tomorrow. Bye, Thank you, Rabbi. Bye-bye, everyone. By the way, Rabbi, Rabbi. Rabbi. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yeah. the sun heats up around 10, 11 o'clock, but the ground and everything is not as hot. In the afternoon, is most of the heat shows up because by that time, the ground and everything else is already warmed up. So, so the Talmud this morning said that there's the, the heat of the sun, meaning in sunny places it's hot, in shady yeah. places it's cold. It's, right. it's, not, it's not cold, but it's not uh, cooler, it's not cooler. cooler. And then at midday is when even in shady places it starts being hot. Now, it that's, might get even hotter true. later on. It might that's get even hotter because later on, midday, it, midday the sun is right over you. Right. Before midday, it's on the east. After uh -huh. midday, it's on the west. Uh -huh. But midday, it's right over you. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. That makes sense. That's true. So, okay. Very good. Good point. So, I goes on to everyone. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.